The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you ask the Lord, of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see his great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. This is the word of our Lord. Our epistle lesson is found in the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now about food sacrifice to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think, it is, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating an idol's temple, in an, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. This is the word of our Lord. Please stand for the Well, we're... Um, just a week away or so from the big game uh, next week, uh, which I will not be watching. Uh, but many of families will be huddled around the TV next week, and they'll probably be looking just as much as the commercials as they will as the action on the field. You know, the commercials are a big deal during the Super Bowl time, and they always kind of give you previews and teasers of those commercials. Advertisers are going to spend millions of dollars trying to attract your eyeballs and get you to open up your wallet and buy some of their products. Many of these uh, commercials and ads will be creative and memorable, and not a few of them will star some celebrity or um, well-known representative to help push merchandise. Now, some of these celebrity pitchmen have get connected to companies and products over the long haul. I mean, who can forget when uh, William Shatner hung up his Captain, Captain Kirk uniform and became the, the pitch man for Priceline.com? And those of you who are older may remember when uh, Yankee slugger Joe DiMaggio moonlighted as Mr. Coffee. 
Brooke Shields rocked her Calvin Klein jeans and Michael Jordan donned his Hanes underwear. They became so connected with the merchandise that over the years, we remember them even though the products have kind of slid into retail obscurity. But as often as a celebrity helps a product line, many times they also hurt as well. Namely, when celebrities go off the rail and do something or say something that is stupid at best or criminal at worst. Consider these cautionary tales. Jared Fogle, who for 15 years was featured on almost every Subway commercial because he lost 245 pounds eating their sandwiches, but is now in jail for um, indecent liberties, let's say. Of course, Subway dropped him as soon as they could as their spokesman. Or Michael Phelps, who used to pitch Kellogg cereals, until a video surfaced in 2009 of him smoking marijuana out of a bong, and Tony the Tiger dropped him. Of course, since then, he's picked up a few new endorsements because I guess Americans are forgiving of winners. Or Tiger Woods, or Lance Armstrong, who were on the top of their respective sports until scandals brought them down along with Nike and Live Strong. These are just a few of the sad stories of spokesmen gone wild, which led to bad image and bad press for the companies they endorsed. Of course, such behavior is not limited to commercial endorsements. The church has had its fair share of scandals and pitchmen that got caught up in scandals as well. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, Jimmy Swagger, to Kenneth Copeland, um, Creflo Dollar, and Benny Hinn, just to name a few. And those who presume to speak for God are watched even more closely than celebrities to see if their conduct and their character match their message that they are preaching. Now, Moses knew that this was going to be an issue for Israel as well. And so in the latter part of Deuteronomy, our Old Testament lesson, he gives some criteria, some advice on how to spot a pitch man who is pretending to be a prophet. So how do you tell the difference between a real prophet and a religious pitch man? Well, Moses says there's really two criteria that you can look at. The prophet will be one like him, like Moses, and two, that that prophet will be raised up among, from among the people to which he prophesies. In other words, the prophet will speak and act according to the law of God and that whatever he prophesies will affect him as much as it will the people because they have been called out from among the people. Now these distinctions are important for us because one, it, it enables them to ground their message in God's word and their work then is in the community in which and out of which God has called them. You see, unlike a celebrity endorsement, you know, who probably doesn't even use the product that they're hawking and whose wealth doesn't enable them to relate to the reviewer, a prophet should be well known by those in his community. People will have had the opportunity to ob observe their public persona, witness their character, and determine whether their message is in accordance with God's word. As God told Moses in the Old Testament lesson, the prophet will speak 
everything that Yahweh commands and those who do not heed him will be held accountable. Thus, whatever the prophet proclaims for the community will affect them as well. To put it another way, the prophet's words are less about you and more about us. So Moses' warnings are a poignant reminder for us today because we live in a day and age in which we can People can download messages from celebrity preachers all over the world who don't even live in the communities that, they, that they're hearing it and have no connection. Um, their only connection is the miles of wire satellite signals. Many of these preachers of which have become celebrities themselves. People in our day assume that if the preacher has a large online following and is selling some book that then they must be a prophet. But not so fast. A true prophet may not have a fat book contract or a TV show. Their people know them, warts and all. And their message is often difficult to hear, which may lead to a much smaller audience. Most of the time, a real prophet is rather reluctant because they know the message they speak will sting them as much as those who hear them in the community. So with these criteria in mind, It's a little easier for us to tell the difference between prophetic person and one pretending to be a prophet. So according to Moses, these are some telltale signs. One, it's all about them. You see, a pitchman is primarily in the business of making money, right? And so they use their position and their platform to manipulate people in that direction. A real prophet, on the the other hand, is more likely to suffer for the word that they are preaching. Witness then Isaiah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, and the disciples of Jesus. If God calls you to be a prophet or a preacher, He's not necessarily doing you a favor. Two, they're holding up other gods. Moses, God warned that there would be prophets who would come and preach about other gods. In Moses' day, that tended to be the gods of the Canaanites. But there are still plenty of gods to go around today. If a prophet is making promises about financial prosperity or a life of happiness or healing if you do certain things or pray a certain way, those are major red flags. The biblical prophets were more concerned about the poor than the rich, as was Jesus. Another, their character doesn't match their message. This is sort of an obvious one, right? If the gospel that they're preaching isn't lived out by them, then they are a religious peddler. And St. Paul warns about religious peddlers in 2 Corinthians 2. He says to watch out for them and to seek out people who speak and act like persons sent from God and standing in the presence of God. Real prophets may not be eloquent in speech, but their life speaks volumes about the truth of the message they are proclaiming. And fourthly, their preaching comes to nothing. Moses gives us a surefire way to tell whether a prophet is a true prophet or not. He says... Does what they proclaim come true? Seems simple, right? 
If it comes to nothing, then they are not speaking God's word. A real prophet knows the difference between his words and God's words. And these are good criteria then for a preachers and congregations to use to evaluate themselves and one another. But you may be asking yourselves, what does this Old Testament lesson have to do with the season of Epiphany? Because Epiphany is all about Jesus declaring himself and making himself known as the Messiah, God in the flesh, the one come to earth to save people from their sins. Well, if you look at the biblical criteria for the prophet that Moses is proclaiming here, you can't help but notice that these criteria were met and exceeded by the one like Moses par excellence, Jesus. Jesus was one like Moses. Like I said earlier, one like Moses meant that he proclaimed and lived according to the law of God. Look at the gospel lessons in the season of Epiphany and how Jesus is keeping and fulfilling God's law, presented in the temple, circumcised on the eighth day, learning and studying God's word. Um, he was filled with grace and healing there. I mean, he was the sinless, he was sinless in accordance to God's law. Pure in life, following the Father's will wherever it led him. He was known in the community. When he was preaching, people would say, wait a minute, isn't this Joseph the carpenter's son? How can he be the Messiah? Two weeks ago, Nathaniel said, Nazareth, can good come from Nazareth? Even Jesus' own brothers and sisters tried to stop him from preaching because, you know, because he was proclaiming that the kingdom of God had come. They thought he was insane. The Jewish Sanhedrin knew Jesus. They tried to stop his preaching as well because he started cutting into their lucrative and prestigious positions of power. His message uh, had the potential of drawing up their financial income. Something had to be done about this Jesus of Nazareth. He spoke God's word. Jesus says that himself in John chapter 8. In John 8, Jesus says, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself except speak what the Father has taught me. Jesus revealed to us most completely the Father. In Him, we find God's essence, that God is love, and that God's will is that no one be lost, but that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of salvation through Him. And finally, what Jesus preached affected him. It affected him like no other prophet because he proclaimed that he would be sacrificed, lifted up, crucified for the sins of the world. And that sacrifice led Jesus down the path to the cross where he indeed became the sinless sacrifice for the salvation of the world. Talk about being raised up. He was raised up on a cross among his own people as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What he preached, he also endured on behalf of his people, taking your place, taking my place under the punishment of sin. Of sin. Instead of gaining wealth, he gave it all away, even his life, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, 
but have everlasting life. So, how can you tell the difference between a real prophet and a religious pitchman? Moses says, ask these questions. Does what he say come true? Does it affect him? Is it more about us and less about you? Jesus is the one like Moses, but greater. He was the prophet like above all prophets, the promised one sent to proclaim that the kingdom of God's grace had arrived. In Jesus, we find truth, character, and love beyond telling. All he did, he did to save the world. And that's no pitch. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us stand.